All right. I would like to welcome to our equity chat, Mr. Eric Burmeister from Menlo Park City School District in California. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Dwayne. It's good to be here. Yeah, paint us a little picture about Menlo Park. Menlo Park City School District is um, a relatively small school district and unique to only a few states in the United States. Uh, we are one of a handful of uh, kindergarten or preschool through eighth grade school districts. And then we feed into a separate school district along with nine other smaller K-8 school districts oh, okay. um, uh, that, that provides our comprehensive high school experience. And so uh, in my district, we have about 3,000 students, although uh, with COVID and the economy and so forth, we've lost about 100 students this year. We do expect that we'll get some of those back um, once COVID is, uh, is passed us, uh, but we're about 3,000 students in preschool through eighth grade. We are in the heart of Silicon Valley. Uh, right down the street from us is the headquarters of Facebook, um, and right around us are uh, Apple, Google, and any number of other large and small tech companies. We're also sort of the center of venture capital for Silicon Valley, uh, and uh, there, uh, just south of our border is Stanford University, one of the largest largest research institutions in the nation. And so uh, as a result of where we're located, we have uh, quite a diverse uh, uh, student body, uh, maybe not so much, maybe not as diverse as other districts in terms of um, socioeconomics. Um, we have a lot of affluence in our area. We have a lot of uh, high income earners. Uh, we also have a lot of middle income earners. Um, and because of uh, the historical redlining, our communities of color and, and, and communities of poverty um, are in pockets throughout the Bay Area. And while uh, there is one directly to our uh, east, uh, um, our students are largely from um, middle to high income families, even though we have a great deal of ethnic diversity and languages spoken in our school district. Um, and as a result of the clientele that we serve, we do have a lot uh, of resources, uh, both through um, our property tax, but also through levies or parcel taxes, as we call them in California, uh, and um, a, a very... Um, uh, prosperous educational foundation that provides us with a great deal of additional resources um, above and beyond the, the, the very small resources that California provides at schools in general. Um, and, uh, but we are not immune to uh, the, the racial, ethnic, um, and language minority issues um, because we are a community that, that really was created out of redlining. Um, yeah. and, um, and so that impacts us. We also have one of the only legal desegregation um, uh, uh, programs that serves our school district. Uh, we have a uh, majority, uh, high poverty and majority um, uh, non-white community to our east called the Ravenswood School District that in the 1980s, there was a legal segregation case and there are seven school districts around that community where students can choose to come into the um, uh, majority white communities uh, for an education. And so about 9% uh, of our students come from, uh, are bust in from that community. How has your perspective of equity shifted with COVID-19? So I think that's a great question. And I, um, I do believe that, that COVID-19 has caused all superintendents to think about equities in ways that we always should have. But uh, the, the impacts of, of, of poverty, the impacts of language minority status, the impacts of systemic racism are really brought to bear um, uh, under uh, the COVID-19 situation. And so I would say that one of the key learnings for us has been how how much even we as a school district that provides so much resource to sort of level the playing field is, is really not enough 
um, uh, to, uh, to overcome all of the hurdles that are necessary for there to be an equitable experience and an equitable access for all students. It really takes more than just a school district. It takes county offices of education, state governments, local governments, cities. Um, uh, it takes um, uh, uh, companies, it takes housing policy experts and everybody to really come together and, and address the issues that are gonna continue uh, to um, impact our low income students and our students of color, uh, but, but they, they impact them even when we don't have COVID. It's just that when we're not in the situation of a pandemic, those, those challenges are easily uh, misunderstood or not addressed because they're not as obvious to, to us as they are doing COVID. So that's, that's probably the most significant, um, I think, realization that, that we've had. And I think for us, being in the heart of Silicon Valley, we've had, you know, a good experience, uh, but there have been a lot of challenges in regards to technology. We need to have uh, 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 high-speed Wi-Fi access available to every family, just like a phone is. Um, and, and that needs to be the rallying cry of every government official uh, and every school district leader um, uh, from now and until that happens. Um, this is a right that everybody has, and it is very clear that, that we need to step up to the plate to make sure that happens. I think in addition to that, you know, one of the things that, that we see very clearly is that having um, parents that have the resources, uh, the skills, mm -hmm. and the time to be able to assist their children uh, in their education is a c very clear example of why our children of color and particularly our first generation college students have so many different obstacles in front of them that families with, with parents who went to college and know how to navigate that process or access tutors or find pods that can support them in this journey, who can answer their questions about the math problem, who know how to log on to the learning management system or whatever. These are all really important equity issues that we are facing right now, but we need to not ignore them once COVID goes away because just because they aren't right in our face anymore, um, they are very real. And one of the silver linings of, of COVID is that it has reminded us of this reality, even if our own personal experience has been different. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree 100%. So when COVID hit your district, did you have students that did not have access to internet in your communities? Uh, so, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons why we're in the League of Innovative Schools as a school district is because we've, we've thought about this issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, usually I would say probably where we've had to shift is not in terms of individual devices, because that's something we've done for the last eight years. Um, uh, we have had to expand technology into the grade levels that we actually don't feel that comfortable um, uh, focusing on technology, that being our primary grade kinder through first grade uh, sorry kinder through second grade um, but but that was a pretty easy uh, uh, hill to get to get over pretty quickly I think the other big shift for us was understanding that we no longer have our libraries and our homework centers to provide on campus access to high-speed internet uh, we needed to make sure that that was in the home. And while we have provided programs for our families for years, many of them didn't take advantage of it because they were able to have their child get the resources they needed on campus through extended day, or, uh, extended day programs like our homework centers and our math clubs. Um, and so what we had to do is we had to bring the, the high speed internet to those homes. Yeah. And, um, and so we were able to provide um, hotspots that we just used our own money for. Um, uh, but we know that not every school district has the resources that we have, but they also have far more need than our school district had. And so um, uh, for them, it was a, a much bigger hill uh, to get over than it was for us. But I would say those are the two biggest issues is putting technology in the hands of kids that we 
didn't necessarily think that was the best use of their time and energy um, mm -hmm. and then training them how to do that. Um, and then I think the other piece uh, was making sure that high speed internet was existing even in the homes that originally didn't need or didn't uh, pursue the offers that we normally provide. Great. Um, one last question. How will you sustain these practices over time? So you heard, you heard you talking about providing internet access and having to shift money. How do you think you're going to sustain that moving forward? Um, well, I, you know, I think that we sustain it by, um, by keeping the conversation going by, you know, what I mentioned earlier is that um, uh, it, it's too bad that COVID brought lessons in front of our face that, that we knew to be true, but I don't think we knew the degree to which it was really impacting our students and, and creating the inequities that are consistently created. Um, but, but the real tragedy would be for us to not learn from those lessons and to ignore the lesson once it's not right in front of our face. And so what we have done is we've created, um, um, uh, we already have an equity task force, but we've also, in addition to that, created an anti-racism task force uh -huh. that is really looking at at what are those systemic policies, those systemic features of public school education in, uh, in the Silicon Valley that impact Menlo Park City School District that we have control over? And even what are those systemic situations that we don't have control over but need to elevate into uh, 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 the conversation, the greater conversation uh, in terms of policy and, um, and governance in our area. And so within our anti-racism task force, we're also broadening the focus, not just about access to technology. We're talking about parent and community education around how we can become an anti-racist community. Yeah. Um, we are also creating a working group around teacher and staff professional development, um, uh, uh, a working group around our curriculum, being uh, asking the question of whose stories are being told, how are they being told, um, and, and are they true? Um, and are we providing voice and choice and the opportunity for people to actually say, I, I, I disagree with that or, or I believe this or here's other information that I've learned and really sort of uh, broadening our perspective of what it means to teach science in an anti-racist way, to teach um, history in an anti-racist way and to elevate voices that haven't been told and to make sure that representation matters and that all of our kids see themselves in the stories that are told. And then the last place is, uh, is a working group on recruitment, hiring, and retention. Um, uh, you know, the Bay Area in general has a history of, um, of not providing opportunities to, um, uh, to uh, people of color for, for advancement and so forth. We don't have, we have our, our communities, like many communities in the U.S., um, uh, are, are, you know, in certain pockets based on, uh, you know, housing policy from, you know, 50 to 100 years ago. And, and we have to understand that those impacts or, or the, those policies, historical policies, have impacts on what our staff look like, wh uh, whether it's housing policy or university entrance policy or what have you. And so not only do we have to be a place that, um, that attracts uh, people of color to come and work with us, but we have to be a place where they want to stay, work, and invest their careers in. And so we are really committed to doing a better job. And we do have a diverse workforce, um, but I would say that one of the reasons why we have a diverse workforce is because we have a very robust Spanish immersion program, not because we have a really good diversity uh, 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 hiring, uh, diverse hiring practices. And so what we want to do is we want to say, um, how do we do better uh, uh, and do better intentionally rather than just rest on the fact that our programs tend to attract a diverse uh, 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 staff, but what can we do as a community to make sure that, uh, that there's intention in that hiring and recruitment and that, that our, our staff uh, who are not white and who are not from the area uh, 
can stay and live and have a life and a family and feel good about the community that they're working in and investing in. Um, and that's hard to do, particularly in a community that is so expensive to live in. Um, but, but we are not daunted uh, by the challenge. We're, we're up for it. And I have incredible support from our board. And our anti-racism task force has over 75 staff and parents who volunteered to be a part of it because they're committed to the work that our district is, um, is doing right now. Wow, there you have it, guys. Superintendent Eric Burmeister from Menlo City Parks uh, City Schools, uh, leading with equity. We thank you, Eric, for all your hard work, and we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks so much, Dwayne. It's an honor to work with you and uh, Digital Promise and the League of Innovative Schools, and uh, we look forward to our next conversation. It's a pleasure to have you.